We probably expected a very small proportion because most of the people who we tested were well. We had 400 positive men. We were somewhat overwhelmed by that because that meant we really had an epidemic. Well, if you can imagine telling several hundred people that they've got a fatal disease, and these were healthy young men generally, who were f terrified of this very moment that we were going to be telling them that they had HIV and, you know, organise your affairs, you're going to die soon. These were my peers, you know, a lot of my patients, I was thinking, well, you know, you haven't done anything I haven't done. Well, the world fell in for our group on uh, October the 22nd, it was actually, that I received a telephone call. Approximately a third of the group were infected and it was pretty shattering. There was an enormous anger saying, you know, the gay community have infected us. But we worked on it and explained to people that but for a large number of the gay community, we wouldn't perhaps have had the amount of blood we had needed to treat over so many years. So there are lots of ways of looking at it. The rest of Australia was not so forgiving when two weeks later, the truth hit home. The gentleman concerned has donated blood 15 times in Brisbane since 1981. Now everyone knew that the virus was in the blood supply. Anyone could be infected. Enormous avalanche of publicity. And I suppose one did have a sense that one was about to be overwhelmed by this bloody disease. One of the most opinionated newspapers was the Daily Telegraph. Editor-in-chief was Ida Butros. This was pretty scary, you know, babies dying from a, a blood transfusion. I mean, of course there was a lot of concern in the community and the telly, being a tabloid, went to town on it. I remember just the huge headlines, I think, I assume on the Daily Telegraph uh, on the day and the, it was a feeling of absolute dread. The New South Wales state government that had only just decriminalised gay sex now moved fast in a different direction. We don't want to create the impression that AIDS is a crime, but we want to emphasise that it's wrong to give AIDS to someone else. There'd be prison and fines for anyone in high-risk groups who gave blood or knowingly passed on the virus. We had a choice in front of us. On one hand, we could adopt what was being adopted in America, sanction, isolation, quarantine, identification, legislation, and to try to get in control of the virus that way. On the other hand, there was uh, an emerging view that we could prevent the virus. The key to prevention was how the virus is transmitted. HIV doesn't spread through breathing or coughing like a cold, but only through very specific behaviours. Now, sex, drug taking, sharing of needles, takes place in bedrooms and back alleys and privately between people. Now, unless you're in that transaction, as it were, you can't prevent it. So no policeman, no doctor, no politician is present when the risk of transmission is greatest. You have to rely on the common sense, the responsibility and the goodwill of parties in that transaction you have to persuade them to act responsibly. Neil Blewett went for a walk through Darlinghurst. I was given a uh, late night trip around these areas and I found that a completely revolutionary experience for me. The walls there, uh, that whole area, it was like a kind of midnight jungle with people whom I really didn't understand the motivations and how they lived. Blewett began to turn this over. If he couldn't save these people, could they? Could the very ratbags and deviants who some said were reaping what they'd sown with this virus ever lead the fight against it? 
This was unmapped political territory. Blewett set out from Canberra. I was working away, as you do, you beaver away uh, in your office most of the time. And the phone rang, and it was Neil Blewett. And he said, do you want a cup of tea? I think he had a sense that he might be coming to some kind of trap when he first arrived. Well, I'm a doctor by trade, and so I was able to understand, number one, what he was saying, and number two, I knew a lot about the disease anyhow. I said, we can't do anything about it if it's going to become a political fight between Labor on one side and the Liberals on the other. And he'd never get the, La the Labor Party cabinet to agree to that. My mission was to get the opposition not to oppose it and the opposition to embrace it if I possibly could. And that's what I set out to do. Next, Blewett needed someone who could sell the message of AIDS prevention. Someone who knew how to press a few buttons. Trust, sympathy, and if necessary, fear. The choice was obvious, if outrageous. It was a bit like being told Uncle Sam needs you, your country needs you. You think, well, gosh, if the government thinks there's the role I can play. I said yes that night. I didn't really dilly-dally around. Well, I was appalled and I actually uh, spoke to uh, Neil Blewett's representative who had rung me, uh, Bill Botel, and said, uh, are you joking? While I knew not a great deal about her, uh, I think she probably knew not a great deal about us. Anal sex, you know, rimming toys, uh, you know, because because I, ha I mean, I knew, of course I knew um, homosexuals, and of course, I, you know, I, I I had them as friends and so on. But I mean, there were some things I'd never heard of, you know, and, you know, and I wasn't the only one. You know, we had to get a course and course and some of that. We had to have some things explained to us. But it turned out really to be inspired. It was a very very clever choice. If you don't know where your partner has slept before he or she sleeps with you, then think about it. Don't. If temptation is too hard to resist, then use a condom. Now Blewett and Botel had to hope that someone would emerge from the streets that they could work with. They had to find them quickly. Some speculated that tens of thousands might already be infected. Now, I know there was some talk where we're going to try and infect the... We're going to inspect the prostitutes to make sure that <coughs> they don't have it. You don't just have a little laboratory in your, in your belly here and you cook it up to uh, spread onto unsuspecting clean clients. <laughs> the, the infection comes from outside and we needed to block that. The Australian Prostitutes Collective took to the streets and got talking. It might be a hard sell, but there were overwhelming reasons to rethink condoms. We would simply just walk down the street saying, OK, this is a, t a sexually transmissible infection, this one, and it's not like any in the past that have been a threat to us. This one has, this one has no treatment whatsoever. They were getting a hearing on the street, but the doors to the city's illegal brothels were slamming in their faces. If the vice squad raided, condoms were evidence for the prosecution. For the moment, nothing could make safe sex safe in the brothels. Particularly in Africa, the earliest epidemic was concentrated in female sex workers. So our best guess was that we were almost certainly going to be having an epidemic amongst that, in that population. Around the world, HIV was spreading at undreamt of speed through a different group, intravenous drug users. I think people only started to care about drug users after they realised that, that they might spread AIDS to the wider general population. Drug users were...